Hey, this is John Baisley uh, from Baroness, and you are watching and listening to the True Philadelphia Podcast with Matt O'Donnell. That is Front Toward Enemy, the lead track off the new Baroness masterpiece of an album, Gold and Gray. The critically acclaimed band has seen impressive worldwide success, especially given its beginnings as an extreme metal band. What Baroness has evolved into now is, well, it's complicated. Just ask John Baisley, the band's founder, lead singer, guitarist, album cover artist, lead composer. You get the idea. This is a DIY operation. Baroness has been based in the Philadelphia area for several years now because, well, John likes us. I spent about two hours with him at his Balakinwood home, which also houses his music and artist studios. We talk more about why this area is such a great fit for him to live and record, why the feminine serves as a symbol for such a muscular rock band, where he likes to hang out in the Delaware Valley, plus his favorite acts in the growing Philadelphia music scene. John Baisley of Baroness on the True Philadelphia Podcast. John Baisley of Baroness here with the True Philadelphia Podcast. We're in your art studio at your home in the Philadelphia area. Thanks so much for having me over. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. So, Spotify. I don't know if you have like a love-hate relationship with it as an artist, but uh, you know how they send out the this is what you listen to in 2019 list? Yeah. yeah. Guess which album I listened to the most? <laughs> well, hopefully it was Golden Gray. It was. It was. <laughs> I was listening at it with my wife, and I'm like, I'm going to be interviewing this guy in like a week. And, I mean, it, it's such a great album. I'm going to talk to you about it in a second. Uh, but the first thing is, you, know, you, you live in Philadelphia. Not many people may know that. Uh, why would you choose living in this area? Um, well, yes. For, first of all, I, I don't think many people know that. I think uh, the Inquirer put out a thing about Philadelphia musicians yesterday or the day before, and we were neglected on that list. Not that, not that I'm sore about that. Well, I'll call them up and yeah. we'll fix that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, um, actually, I mean, the, the question is the question itself uh, sort of explains the uh, my reasoning for moving here. I mean, one one of the reasons that I moved up here was to enjoy the benefits of a major metropolitan area, but somewhere where I felt that I could also maintain my own level of privacy, which, you know, as, as the career of this band has um, moved upward and upward over the years, uh, I find has become increasingly more, more of a, a, a thing that I need, you know, uh, if I'm on tour eight or nine months out of the year, the last thing that I want when I get home is to be bombarded with social situations and and you know this you know you're tired. I, I'm tired. Yeah, it's a better way. This better way way of putting it. And I spent so I spent the better portion of the early uh, half of my life in sm much smaller communities uh, like the like uh, the community in southwestern Virginia, Lexington, Rockbridge County, where I grew up. Uh, also, Savannah, Georgia, where the band was started, which is a very small city. Uh, you know, so the sort of town where you know reputations and and uh, things fly around, and you know everybody knows everybody else's business. And honestly, I th when I had, you know I have uh, I have a wife and a daughter, and we had lived, we had found we founded the band in, in two thousand two to two thousand three, uh, and had been living in Savannah in, from two thousand one. I think it was the end of 2010, as the year was turning turning over, um, my family and I decided to move. And we really wanted to have the experience of living in a metropolitan area. Uh, so West Coast was too far, you know, because we've got all of, our, all of our extended families on this coast. And then it, it really was just kind of a 
process of elimination otherwise. Um, you know, Boston is too far north and too, at the time, like maybe too much of a cultural jump for us. New York, too big, too expensive. Um, Richmond, nah. DC, nah. Baltimore, nah. So it was kind of left with Philly. Uh, and, uh, you know, also to that fact, my my parent, both of my parents are from Philadelphia. Uh, so it wasn't an unfamiliar city for me to move to. Um, and I've loved, I, honestly, I've loved, I've loved it since I, since I've moved back here. Uh, it felt in a way, it felt like moving back home when I came up here. And, uh, you know, I, I think I went, I went to uh, elementary school here. Oh, you did. Cause I, I was going to ask you, your parents were born in Philadelphia and you did live for a little bit of time in the city. Yes, so I lived. I lived, you know, actually pretty close to here uh, when I was a when I was a young child, and that and at the end of at the end of elementary school, uh, my family and I moved down to Virginia, which is where I spent. I guess you could call it my formative years. You're a Virginian at heart, basically. Yes, but it's it, you know like all the geographic and regional stuff that applies to my life is difficult. It's sort of difficult for me to claim one thing or another because I, you know, if I, if I sit, you know, if, if we call the band from Georgia, then all of our friends in Georgia say, well, no, you're not from Georgia. You just moved here and started the band in Georgia. And now you're in Philadelphia. So we're not really from Georgia. We're not really from Philadelphia as a band. I'm not, you know, I was, I was born here in Pennsylvania, uh, in Pittsburgh actually, but spent most of my most of the important years in my life uh, in rural Virginia, uh, but I've moved. I've moved all over the place so frequently that it's it, it is it's become very difficult to claim one spot or another as my own. And I think that's by design for me. You know, I like I. I mean, I'm a touring musician. I love to move around. I love the adventure, uh, and I love the idea of being somewhere new every day. So the fact that I haven't ever really settled down in one place for too long isn't, isn't much of a surprise to me. So you just got back from your tour in Europe, yeah. and you were at, in so many places. I mean, I, I think you were in France, Luxembourg, the UK, Finland, Germany. The one thing I'm curious about is, I mean, I, I traveled to Oregon earlier this year, and I came back and I was an absolute wreck. I mean, it's a, it's a time zone change. It's the travel. It's being in unfamiliar circumstances, trying to eat while trying to exercise. How do you do all that over and over and over again and still be a standing human being? Well, I, th- I mean, I think that I think the the point there is that, that, you know, in in the world of music, if we're just if we're just, you know, if we just keep this strictly to, you know, that part of my profession, there are there are musicians who are fantastic musicians but not, uh, are terrible at touring uh, and there are mediocre musicians who are incredible at touring um, that's what I have always considered myself as, as a mediocre musician who just happens to be good at at the touring lifestyle uh, I would disagree with that point but you, you may continue <laughs> uh, look I put, I put my 10,000 hours in I think, that, I think that's what it is you know I'm, I'm also stubborn and uh, I'm ambitious and I don't really overthink. How can you say that you're, I mean, again, the 10,000 hours thing, you sing, you play guitar, you, you write all the material, you do the artwork. Mediocre is not even in the equation. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe mediocre is the wrong word because that, that's kind of got a negative connotation. I think I'm okay. I think, I think more than anything else, I'm, I'm, dedicated to, I'm dedicated to what I do. I'm, I'm very passionate about the things that I'm interested in, the things that I've you know the passions and and of my youth that I that I just have been fortunate enough to turn into professions and like I said I I think you know you put you put the hours in you put the effort in you put the you you have to put a ton of work into it uh, you also have to get lucky at certain points mm-hmm. along the road and you have to be kind of willfully indignant I guess about a lot of things uh, because there are so many compelling reasons not to not to have this lifestyle. But for those of us that do it, I mean, we genuinely love it. And, you know, back, back to the question about, you know, about traveling so much, you, it's, it's just one of these, it's just one of these things. It's, it's seems like it's kind of a binary thing. Some people are good at it. Some people aren't changing time zones, changing climates, changing altitudes, changing, 
you know, having a nothing remotely regular as a sleep routine. Um, there's always a question mark about what your what your next meal is going to be, where you're going to get it. Um, you know, there's no th- no there's no such thing as financial stability. There's really no stability. The only you know the on- the only thing that I the only stability that I have and the- what I hang my hat on the reason that this whole thing works for me is because I believe in what I'm doing and that's that's the that's the foundation stone for for all of it. Uh, I happen to like that variety. You know that that each day is kind of a a surprise with plenty of twists and turns and it's not it's not easy you know by design tour the 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 lifestyle of a tour musician is not simple in any way shape or form we perform for you know say two hours a night well there's 20 22 other hours of the day that we have to fill with something you know this is i think that's why there's so many cliches of you know or that's why the cliche exists and is real for uh you know, artistic types who, you know, go off the rails and d- develop all sorts of, you know, problems uh, in their lives. I mean, the difficult thing is finding time to exercise, figuring out a way to, you know, maintain a health, you know, healthy eating habits, healthy sleeping routines. Uh, you just sort of find it where you find it. It's, it feels, I don't know, I've toured a lot this year. I mean, I've basically been on tour since March and it's December now. So, um, you know, Close to 200 shows, I think, this year. That, that's a lot. That is a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. And it, I don't know. I think part of it is that, you know, people like me, we just, we like the adventure of it. You know, we like that we, de- you know, we detach and, and are just sort of these free floating spirits, you know, roaming around the earth. I mean, it's, it's because, on, you know, superficially it sounds great. Like, uh, you know, I played every every major country in Western Europe. We were going to Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Southeast Asia next year. Talk uh, about jet lag there, man. Yeah, Jeez. but you, but part but part of the gig is that the jet lag is going to be there. So we essentially are conditioned to it. I think in a way um, where we we know how to anticipate those extreme levels of, t- of exhaustion and we understand how to, you know, uh, reserve our energy for the stage if we're touring. And, uh, I think most of, I think most of us who, who really, who really get addicted to touring or who really depend on touring, who love touring, I think the more difficult thing is for us to come home and have, and to create regular routines because the, allu- the, the type of personalities that they get drawn into this world generally aren't the type of personalities that want to wake up in the same place every day and have, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner at regimented times or, you know, clock into an office or, or you know, a- any of those things. Uh, you know, this, this lifestyle is sort of my response to and fear of having... Doing what I do. <laughs> I mean, in, in so many words, yeah, yeah. And it's not to say that one way is better or worse because... The other side of this is the you know the sacrifices that you make in order to be this world traveling explorer musician person. The sacrifices are tremendous. Uh, you know, you, you're, there's there's people that you love and care about at home. There's you know if you if you, tra- if you have any kind of social life, it just goes straight on hold when you do that. Everything stops. We go on tour. We come home and expect everything to be the same for us. Meanwhile, life's moved on for everybody else around us. So that, that's its own. That's its own difficulty. I mean, it's it's complicated and it's not easy. And uh, we've been through seven lineup changes, in part due to the fact that it's very difficult to sustain this lifestyle in a healthy, productive, creative way. Uh, and I feel that I have, but I know that I've seen the strain on uh, musicians who've been in this band who've left for no other reason simply than their passion for the travel and the chaos and the turbulence has diminished yeah, and they below a certain level I mean, below a certain level it's just not worth it i mean honestly it's not worth it like i wouldn't it's it's pointless to even convince somebody that you're playing with if they've if they've already made up their you know if their mind is already uh moving towards something that's more secure and more regular you can't make playing in a band sound good to them it just sounds you know everything sounds like a nightmare at that point because you got to write a record and what does writing a record mean it's not 
it's not as linear as you as you think it is. No, it's not. No, it's not like. Uh, well, you spend two hours doing this, an hour doing that. You know, six minutes doing this. Take a lunch break. Spend the rest of the afternoon doing X, Y, or Z, and then you got a song. No, some songs you can write in ten minutes. Some songs take ten years to write. I mean, I've written both. I've written songs that are written in the space of an afternoon, and I've written songs that I've literally been living with for ten years. Uh, so you sort of have to love all of that, you know. And I, I, I thrive on stress and chaos and turbulence and anxieties and everything, thing like that. They work for me as a creative person. That's that's sort of the fuel that I have. As as odd as that might sound, as as uh, you know, I think otherwise those forces forces would you know have a more or less destructive impact on my life. But I've figured out a way to channel them into the art and the music that I make, and therefore I'm you know sort of taking negatives and hopefully spitting them back out as positives. I wish I wish more people were like that. <laughs> yeah, I wish, me, me too. <laughs> so I saw you guys play at the Decibel Metal and Beer Fest. Right. in uh, uh, Dillmore, Fillmore. Uh, Fillmore, Fillmore. Fillmore. And uh, it was a great show. And let me just give you a one-word reaction. Confidence. Like, th- this version of Baroness, like, when, when I saw you guys up on stage, I'm like, these guys are all bought in, and they're, they know they're going to blow us away. Yeah, I mean, it's a, that's the exciting thing about this, this, what's been going on with us for the past couple of years is... Um, we have finally gotten ourselves a lineup and a group of musicians and a crew and a team behind us where everybody trusts and respects the process. Everybody loves playing, you know, the, the idea of rehearsing and writing and recording and touring and, you know, doing all the things that you need to do, uh, to, to be a, be an active and touring musician. You know, we're, we're all excited by that and we all, uh, you know, we all look forward to each of the, you know, each part of that process. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, in the past, some, you know, on occasion, sometimes there's a, there's been a band member or or some feeling or mentality inside the band that, you know, some aspect of the work is kind of a drag. Uh, Right now, I think that confidence is just due to the fact that we're all, we're all, we're all really excited. You know, we're, Mm -hmm. we've sort of pushed beyond, um, where we th- what we thought we were capable of, and we held ourselves to an extremely high standard uh, when writing our last record, and really did something that, m- to this day, you know, this re- record came out in June, it's December now. To this day, we, it, it's still a bit of a mystery how we made the record. I mean, it wasn't; it was the least obvious, obviously composed and written record that we've done. There was there was more. Uh, sort of more, Im, Im, I guess, improv, and, and there was less <laughs> organization and structure to the to oh, the yeah, to I the creation. I mean, it's, it's it, and so what what came out was we, you know, I, I I like to be the I like to think that you know in the in our group dynamic, I'm I'm the guy who has I have to see the forest through the trees. There goes the light. There goes um, the light. <laughs> <laughs> We're in <laughs> darkness. <laughs> Okay, anyway. <clears throat> um, you want to put that other one back in there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. John Baisley in a different light here. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you were, you were talking about the record and, and being complicated. L- let me uh, pull it out. I mean, I got this thing yesterday. You, you love records. I mean, most audiophiles do, right? Golden Gray, and I mean, you did the artwork, and it's a double album, and you got all sorts of things going here. I used to love buying albums because they would have the lyrics in them, and back when I was a kid and you were a kid, you, you didn't know what they were talking about, and there was no internet. And it has the lyrics in here, which is really cool, too. But I mean, my reaction to the album was these guys are getting more and more complicated. They are going places that they're uncomfortable with, and they're coming out. And it's all making sense. And at the same time, you still get those songs that are like, that's a barn burner right there. That's a barn burner right there. And so congratulations. I mean, it's a great album. I think it is a great album. Yeah. No, I mean, this is this this one. I'm 
I'm more proud of this than I am of our of our prior records. Uh, it was made uh, to just f if for no other reason that it it was a much it, it required so much greater effort from the group than our former records. Seemingly, you know, it it had we were we stayed up. It would, it had us more worried late at night. It had us more excited when we got when we got our mixes finished. Uh, and it was much, you know, it had us confused at times. It ha I mean, it, we, we quite frequently, uh, in either in rehearsals or in, or in the studio environment, were just scratching our heads and wondering what we were doing. You know, like what 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 kind of music? Are, what kind of music are we writing? What you know? What what is going on here? Uh, and it, it, you know it, what it did. What this most recent record did, and I think it has to do with the lineup. I think it has to do with our, you know, the amount of time that we've been, spent as a band, and you know, a variety of factors. But really, this one forced us to examine uh, our our own passions and our own uh, motivations for making music, and it forced us to to really. Uh, you know, through that process, identify those things and become become as comfortable with them as possible. Because the whole point was to move, you know, where, whatever whatever a hundred percent was for each of us individually and for the band as a whole. We were really trying to push ourselves beyond that, so that everything was a little, you know, so that I'm playing just on the edge of my capability as a, as a as a guitar player. I'm singing just a you know just on the other side of my full capabilities as, as a vocalist and as a band we're we're constantly on that sort of razor's edge um where if we move f for to you know if we move forward too fast we're everything's going to fall apart but uh you know simultaneously if we held back at all then what's the point in doing this anyway you know like we've put out a we've put out this this is our fifth studio album um and i think that for a band, for any band that's put out four studio albums, three studio albums, even your the burden on your shoulders is to is that you were, you the musician remain motivated and interested in what you're doing, uh, because at the at the point where you've got a couple records out and you've got fan you've got a fan base and you've got people who recognize you for what you're doing, it's very easy to hear all the compliments and it's very easy to buy into all all the you know the hyperbole and the, you know, the great reviews and the people who are, you know, who come up to you at the, at the end of a show and say, ah, you know, that was the greatest show I've ever seen. And you have to sort of understand that that's not necessarily true. You know, people get excited at shows and are going to say things like that. Uh, and as musicians, if we start listening to, or if we start paying attention to only the positive comments or, you know, the negative comments or whatever, that, that might influence our music. That might we might start writing music for those journalists. You never want to respond through your artistry, right? Yeah, and so so for me, I mean the goal the goal of this band, I may this may be somewhat unique to this to this band, but our goal is 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 sort of to continually push forward and to continually hold ourselves to higher and higher standards and write better and better music and think more creatively and you know the 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 format that we play in we've got two guitars we've got a bass we've got a drummer uh and i i sing and, and our guitar player gina sing that's that's a pretty well trod path sure. you know that right. there's there's not much there's not much there's not many new things to say in that format so that makes it all the more difficult for us because our whole goal is to find is to turn those stones over that haven't been touched yet, and to find something new that we can be doing as musicians uh, in a, in an old format. You know, it's now become an old format. I guess you know we're basically playing classic rock by some metrics. I mean, if you just look at the, if you just look at the facts, you know, loud guitars, bass, drums, vocals. That's that's classic rock. Modern music has m much more emphasis on electronics or or auto tune which i hate yeah or just like simple hooks and and you know and repetitious words so that the audience can you know audience knows the second chorus by the time it arrives our goal is not to make things simple for our audience it's not to make things simple for ourselves it's to but it's not necessarily to make things more complex either it's to become more genuine to dig in a little deeper and to find something 
you know, in the through the using music primarily um, to say something fresh, to say something unique, to say something that's relevant this year, to say something that's personal, you know, and 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 genuine and in earnest, and something that you know, by virtue of the fact that we're challenging ourselves, we are transmitting that challenge uh, and uh, to our to our audience and. At the same time as we're doing this, and we're we're like willfully challenging our audience, we're also we're also trying to we've always tried to be an inclusive band. Uh, so it also means that we're inviting new people in to experience this music that we play, which is by definition not the simplest affair. And so it's you know it's a very big gamble to engage in when there's lives you know when people's livelihoods are riding on it you know it's it'd be easy if this was just a like a sort of a weekend pastime for hobby us. right but but we we spend the vast majority of our lives doing it and for those of us that do this and you know for people who are wired like me this is it's an all-consuming thing like uh it when i'm in the thick of it when when ambition strikes or not ambition when when my inspiration uh you know bubbles up and i can feel that and that that's something that you really have to you know, grab by the horns and ride it till it's till it's done. Uh, you know, the rest of life becomes sort of a hazy blur for me because I get hyper focused on on what I'm doing, and that, I think that's I think that's probably the the reason I've made it this long is because I, I you know for better or for worse I sort of block the rest of the world out when I'm when I'm on when I'm onto something. Uh, but as I said before, this is all this pursuit of you know, of artistry and creativity and, you know, being genuine and authentic and all these, like, buzzwords that people like to use. Um, and so, you know, I apologize if I, if I come off, you know, if these sound like platitudes or cliches, but they, but I, I mean them, you know. I mean every one of them. It's, it's a, you know, it's been, it has been an absolutely wild ride in order to get just to this place where we're, you know, where you and I are speaking uh, and not not without its fair share of uh, bumps and bruises along the way. But what we do, we love. I mean, we love to do what we do, and we we feel that uh, you know, in that way, that every musician I f- has a, you know a little bit of narcissism at the bottom. I mean, we feel well, that. I have it too. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, but but in order in order to in order to hold a microphone, in order to address a group of people, you have to feel like. You know, inside you have to have the confidence that what you are about to say or play or do is going to have some value to somebody else. Absolutely. You know, whether whether or not it's it's uh, you know sharing information or retelling a story or or guiding people's emotions or forcing people to confront things about themselves. Uh, you know, it's 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 communication, and we need a little we need a little we need a little ego to get there to get started, uh, but to to maintain it and to stay there. And you, I'm sure that you have some corollaries in, in, in your career, uh, you know, you really, you really find out what you're made of uh, at each turning point in your career. You know, at each point where you have an opportunity to settle back down and, and you know, fade out of the spotlight, so to speak, or to stay in it, you have to, re- you know, you have to constantly redefine yourself. You have to constantly redefine your uh, you know the reasons for your ambitions. You have to re- you, know, you have to sort of ask these big existential questions on a fairly regular basis, and that's that in and of itself is sort of difficult. You know. Yeah. So the fans of Baroness know that every album has a different color. Some yes. have two because they have two records in them. What's your favorite color? My favorite color. Or my favorite record. Favorite color, like flat out color. Uh, I think when I'm. You know, when I'm out, when I'm just making things as an artist, I think I favor yellows and greens. I think I favor those colors. I don't know that they are my favorite. I think it's. I think maybe it's hard to ask an artist if they have a favorite color. I figured it would be hard, maybe but I. Like Keith Haring, what his favorite color would be? We say like black and white, obviously. Um, but for you know, for me, it's the idea. Like the idea of colors is a really thrilling thing because each color has its own. Um, symbolic meaning, but it also has its own, um, you know, sort of sort of difficult to articulate. Uh, it had it, it elicits reactions out of people, and 
you know, to, to be an artist, to be a musician and to have, to understand, you know, the, the further you study and the more you, the more you practice, the more you understand that you can, you can actually use colors to make people, you know, just colors and like leave images out of it, leave everything else out of it. You can use just the, you know, the different frequency wavelengths of these colors to make people feel a different way. You know, hospitals are painted in these cool muted colors to keep people calm and relaxed. And, you know, red lights are red because that wavelength of light travels much further and has a much more alarming impact on us. So the color of Satan too. Yeah. 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 I mean, but for, but for a reason, because it's shocking and it's, it's alarming. So it's, it's, you know, it's interesting to, it's it's been interesting for for me, um, you know, having grown up as a, as a kid who who made art all the time and who, who was constantly trying to figure out how to make music work. It's kind of like uh, it's interesting for me now at, at this stage in my life to have the time to refine my understanding and really study color uh, and study you know t- like different tones and you can really get very granular and very mi- microscopic on the on the you know on your use of these things. Uh, and that's what I mean by, uh, you know, as as our careers continue, continue, I think we, I think for me, I, I always have to have something that, some new obsession that fits in, you know, fits in with the art and the music that I make. Like, uh, you know, more, re- like the, 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 the difficult thing with this most recent album was, um, uh, and I'll, you know, I'll try to keep this brief, but we've, we've essentially been trying to, it's, we started we got a excuse me. We had a record deal in 2006, and we put our first full length record out in 2007, which was Red Album. Yeah. Uh, the joke at the time with the with my drummer uh, Alan, who was who was in the band at the time, was that I you know he knew I didn't want to do album titles. You know I, I didn't want to come, try to come up with these like phrases or words that would encapsulate these albums because they were they were big they were big slabs of my life and I didn't I just I've always had a really hard time it's really given me anxiety to try to give it a name like I don't understand how you name a book or a movie um and you know I was always sort of into the you know like Led Zeppelin albums they just one two three four simple it doesn't say much about the record but when you say Led Zeppelin four, I know what I know the songs on it. You know, you can pay, I picture the album cover. I picture I know what songs are on it, and that's just because you've given me the number. So Alan, our drummer at the time, said, "Well, why, dude, you should do colors because because you're an artist, and that'll you know it'll have the same sort of uh, same sort of impact as you know just doing a numeric thing. Uh, but you know, wouldn't it look wouldn't it be hilarious if we got through the whole color wheel, and you know, then our merch table is going to look like a rainbow, and that was funny because it was funny mostly because we didn't think we were going to, there, there's no way we were going to make six records. Like that, that was the joke was, yeah, if we, if we do them all, then it'll look like rainbow. The first part of that joke was we didn't think we were, we didn't think we were good enough to put out one record, let alone five or six. Uh, and the, you know, the second thing was at that point, and this would, this was in, you know, 2006, 2007, we were very much associated with like, punk rock, heavy metal, hardcore, like the sort of underground music scene, which had a very, uh, some very standard aesthetics, you know, you know, like the black, white, red, that's all you ever saw. You know, you see these t-shirts, so it's always just black and black, white, and red. That's, that's, those were the only colors you ever see. Uh, it was, there wasn't like this florid, colorful thing going on. It was all really tough, really masculine, very, like, macho. Uh, and what we wanted to do was we wanted to provide an all, you know, in, our, in, that, in that genre that we were associated with at that time, we wanted to do something that was different. Uh, and, you know, as an, as an artist, I thought, well, if we just, like, take all that masculine, tough guy stuff out and replace it with something that's more sensual, more emotive, more uh, colorful, then that, that, will, that, that is going to make us stand out. Well, that kind of answers my next question, because, you know, every album, even with the latest one, there's always a woman or women yeah. on the cover. The name of the band is Baroness, is a female. Uh, this metaphor that you have, I guess it is that response to trying to not be sort of pegged into a certain a certain shape right yeah i mean i think that it's it has always been 
part of our part of our philosophy not to fit squarely in with something popular or trendy. Uh, practically speaking, this you know it serves a purpose that when said trend trend dies, that we're not associated with it, so we don't die along with it. But uh, it's also it's more that I. I think that you know it's the duty and obligation of certain artists to, to just to question everything. You know, We're not not just to question what's happening outside of our scene, but to question more more importantly what's happening inside of it. And the reason I was initially attracted to you know punk rock and hardcore and and metal and and those type of music genres was because they. Uh, they spoke to me as a when I was a younger person, and they they spoke to my angst, they spoke to my anger, and my uh, you know all of these emotions that I was I was just beginning to feel in, in you know in, in very acute forms, and I had no I didn't really have a good outlet for for them, and you know it really kind of for me it started with like you know a band like Nirvana when when they when they dropped, and you know as a kid who was living in the country. Who, didn't didn't I didn't have shows coming through town all the time. I didn't have a whole lot of, uh, you know, I didn't have an older brother, and I didn't have friends with older brothers whose music taste I liked. So I didn't have, I didn't have somebody showing me what was cool. But when I saw Nirvana, I saw, you know, I, I think like everybody else my age, we we saw all of the all of these teenage feelings sort of condensed and filtered and presented in a way that we that we that spoke to us and that we reacted to. I mean, it's still kind of surprising to me that that band for a brief period in time was the biggest music music act in the world. So I mean, Nevermind was that album or just something clicked in your mind that Nevermind. never happened before? Yeah, Nevermind was that album. Uh I mean, I li- I liked I I had a leaning towards rock music before that. I think you know, I had like a Def Leppard and an NXS record. Um, but, uh, you know, for the most part, I was listening to what was on the radio and, uh, you know, I, I always associate at that point in my life, uh, I would associate, re- you know, music that was on the radio with like my dad's music, you know, it was like, it was like too square. It just, it didn't have any danger to it. And I, and what I, I think what I was, what I sought was something that, that challenge, that was a challenge, you know, and, and when I heard Nirvana, you know, it was just like loud guitars, banging drums, and it was loose but but it was also pop music, but it also spoke to me. It's kind of angular and distorted and nasty, but there was beauty to it and there was depth, and that was that you know that was sort of my introduction. And I immediately just went very deeply into the the underground that that uh, you know that they'd come from, and I discovered punk rock and I discovered all this aggressive, fast, loud music that get, that that. And the scene that came along with it, which really taught me my ideals and, you know, about... Um, DIY. Yeah, about, about DIY. I mean, that, that was the most important thing that, that I got out of my teenage years and my fascination and my involvement with, with punk rock was that my perception prior to discovering that was that, you know, the, I, I didn't understand, you know, like how a band like Led Zeppelin, like, how do, you, how do they get there? How, you know, and I still don't really understand how any of these bands get there, but I did understand, and I could I could see the point A to point B ness of a band like Nirvana, where you just you don't need to know too much about music. You just need to love. You just need to love it, and you just make a bunch of racket, sort of form it into a song, and that's how you do it. And uh, you know, you know, it's effectively when I heard Nevermind, I thought. Maybe I can be a musician. So that's the album that also made you want to become a musician too. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and then as I said, after that I, I got into the the very you know very very underground stuff, which I've always been into since then. Uh, and I found I found a, I found that community more and more as I as I as I grew and, and moved around, and I found independent thinkers, people who you know where, where look if you want to if you are like for instance when Baroness started. Okay, we need some T-shirts to sell at shows. Okay, well, we already know how to screen print because we taught ourselves how to screen print, so we make our own shirts. Uh, well, now we need to book a tour, and this was in the MySpace era, and there was a community of there was a DIY community of people who would book you in their house, in a VFW hall, uh, in you know some dingy club that didn't care, whatever. And I booked the tour. 
then you drive the tour, then you sell your own merch, you learn how you learn all these things that ultimately, you know, if you if you experience enough success, you're going to hire somebody who's really good at that specific thing. Uh, But because I knew how to book tours, and because I knew how to drive and tour manage and sell merch and print merch and record music, and you know, because I knew all the aspects of it, I knew what to look for in the people that I was hiring, I, you know, in terms of their skill level, but also in terms of their attitude. And, I, you know, I've tried as much as I'm able over those years to work with people who've come from that same kind of background because we all get it. I think Fugazi was the one band that, that yes. was like, it's almost like a religion to them, right? Yes. And, and so I grew up in Virginia, which wasn't too far from D.C., which yeah. is where Fugazi was from. And and through through Fugazi, you know, we got we got all this. You know, you'd always hear rumors about them, you know, or or you'd read about them in fanzines, five dollar shows, never more than five dollars for a show. So it taught us about respect for our for for uh, for an audience, and you know, the, those lessons that those lessons that I learned, you know, in my teenage years stuck with me. And as our success has grown as we've accumulated more fans and you know more of the world has begun to pay attention to what we do i think it's very important i think it's critical in fact that we don't lose those ideals that we had uh you know in in the early in, a, in all of our early years because all the members of this band have something of a diy background uh if they didn't you know this is lineup number seven or something like this. So it's not all, it's not still all my friends from the, from down the block, but it still is like-minded people who are willing to get their hands dirty, uh, as opposed to the other way that, you know, that, that I, that I'm aware it's, it's, it's a similarly effective way of getting where, wherever you need to go as a musician, but you, you know, the one where you go to school and you learn how to, you learn all the names for all the notes and all the chords. And then you, you know, you hire a manager and you hire a booking agent, you hire a, publicist and you get all you get a strong team at the beginning and you develop your brand and then you sell your brand i think that works but that's not for me you know that's never been for me i i I, again i'd like to think that we can stand as something of an alternative to that idea because it's not it's not that we don't have a booking agent or uh you know a manager or uh you know a team of people and a crew that we tour with that helps us put the shows on it's just that the way that we came up was, was you know, was it took a long time. I mean, Bar- the, the history of Baroness, the history of my career in art, has just been a, cur- a career of taking one step at a time and never, never going for the easy, quick money and never going for the easy, quick fix. Because at the end of the day, I want to have a career in this because I love doing this. So I don't, I'm acutely aware of the fact that if you go too far too fast, you do, people do have a tendency to burn out and then leave altogether. And I want to be involved in this in the rest, for the rest of my life. So I have, over the years, maintained the relationships with the same people that I met in 2002 when we were first starting. And, you know, the people that are willing to go, come along and take that, take that trip with you, you keep them close to you like family. And lo and behold, at the, you know, at the end of it all, my band, my crew, my team is like a family like we we eat together we when we tour there's there's no division you know between the artists and the crew we're we're we we act commute more communally than that because we all understand that we're each part of this process and we're each part of you know the the show that we're putting on requires that we all care about it Mm -hmm. um and and i think i think that some people lose sight of that because if you have the money you can just you can pay for all this stuff to get sure. done, yeah. uh, but asking people to work extremely hard and you know bend over backwards is a whole. It requires that you maintain their respect and their trust and everything. I don't, I don't, maybe I'm getting tangential here, but you know I think I think it's I think it's an important. It's it's been important to me over the years to uh, to act with uh, a strong sense of uh, ethics and a moral code because if you don't have that you you really you can really there's a lot there's a lot out there a lot of people you can sort of whose backs there are you can step on to achieve success there's a lot of people you can sort of effectively screw over in order to further your own career and i'm just not willing to do that a couple questions about your tour bus crash is that okay um so you know most people know what happened but it was in 2012 bath england uh everyone survived uh but it changed everyone's lives um 
have you ever been back to the site of the accident? Uh, you were in the UK during the tour. Yeah, yes. Uh, well, immediately, like, uh, so I was hospitalized for for quite a while, and then I was um, I was stuck in England for a few a few months after after the accident because I wasn't cleared I wasn't cleared to fly. My body was broken badly enough that uh, I couldn't really I really couldn't leave this apartment that we were in. So the day that I was uh, cleared to go, got the got a plane ticket and I visited the actual site of the crash that day just because I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, I have experienced a major trauma with a group of people and, and it was, you know, it was an experience that we're still trying to figure out how it didn't kill us all. It was, you know, bus falling on, you know, nearly 40 feet off of a cliff and, it, you know, and my body was, you know, my, my arm, basically broke off my leg snapped in half Every, you know, everything was just a wreck so the fact that I survived it was you know miraculous I wasn't going to let the you know certain aspects of that get become too emotionally powerful for me so uh so I did visit the site of the the accident just just to sort of begin the immediately just to sort of begin the process of uh getting rid of that psychic emotional physical baggage that it you know that, that it had for me but then on this most recent tour uh back in September when when it started we we did drive through Bath and we did we were staying um in a small town that was probably 5 miles away from that that location the 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 actual location of the accident and uh then we spent three days in Bristol, um, oh, like a week later. And Bristol, Bristol, having been the last show that we played in 2012 before the accident. So the, so uh, in in 2012 we played a show in in Bristol, uh, at a venue called the Fleece. And then the next day we were headed to Southampton. That's when we crashed. We we actually stayed in Bristol. We had a show there and a couple of days off. We stayed at the venue. You know, the bus was parked at the venue that we played. So that was something. And I spent three days in this or two or three days in this little town that uh the last time I had been to it was the last night that I had before this new reality kicked in uh which is you know which is a big thing because I'm aware of what ha- you know the 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 chronic pain and uh, you know some of the physical realities of that uh in the aftermath of that accident is something that I live with on a daily basis so I did get some time to process that you know, now here is like seven years after the fact, and it was nice. You know, it was nice. It wasn't. It started off a little odd, and I, and you know, kind of got that weird pit in your stomach sort of feeling. And everything is, you know, everything there was was. You know, just sort of had an odd feeling to me, uh, but by the end of my time there, you know, after a couple of days off, I realized that I had sort of gotten past that, at least superficially, and I now feel. Like I have a a special connection to that city in, in particular and to Bristol, uh, which I didn't expect. I didn't expect to have that feeling, um, but I did feel very connected to the city while I was there. And so I think that you know, in the sil- you got to find a silver lining from this because otherwise it's just you know a, a fairly sizable thundercloud. Um, that was you know that was something nice that I could take away from uh, the the location at least. This is a fate or free will type of question. Mm-hmm. Did the accident have to happen for you to still be you and for Baroness to still exist? I don't, I don't think that it necessarily had to. Um, I know it's, it's kind of a messed up question, but no, no, do you no, understand I, what I'm I, trying to I, say? I understand what you're saying. Um, I think, if anything, that the, the accident itself, because well, let, me, let me back up. People ask me all the time, did it, did it, change, you know, did it change the way that you value life or... Did it give you a new appreciation for what you have? And my answer to that is initially sort of shocking because it it didn't. What it did was it proved all you know. For for me at least, my my experience with that is that all of my hypotheses about how I valued life and how I valued the uh, you know the profession that I'm in uh, and the arts that I'm that I'm engaged in it it 
it, be, it turned those hypotheses into facts for me. It strengthened and emboldened me uh, in a way that has allowed, you know, it's probably allowed me further confidence, but I'm not sure that I wouldn't, I'm not positive that I wouldn't have found that out in due time. It sort of, it felt like it just kind of hustled things along and, you know, had the, it had, you know, all the, all the negative stuff aside, it, you know, it, it did for, it did f- because, because I'm sorry, I get a little tongue twisted here, but after, you know, after going through a, like a, a very long recovery and a recovery, which at the end of it, you're still left with, you know, tremendous amount of pain and, uh, you know, and some, I, I, I hesitate to call them disabilities, just some things I can't do sure. physically. Um, I do spend my time focusing on the stuff that I was left, you know, the things that I was left with. And I am acutely aware of the fact that when, you know, being that, being that my arm was n- very nearly amputated and I, and I'm a musician, I still do have the capacity to play my, my chosen instrument, the guitar, uh, and with, with very little, uh, diminishment in my, uh, flexibility or, or strength or anything like that. When you weigh that against the fact that I, with my left hand, which is the injured arm, I can't remove the top of, uh, like a, jar of peanut butter so that's jar. weird right that's there. weird it's weird that i can play yeah. i can perform but i can't perform I, I can't perform the simple task uh of removing you know the top of a jar you were like, meant to play music and not make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches yeah. so it's so i'm not saying that i'm not saying it does it it's difficult for me to say one way or the other like if that if that needed to happen uh or not but I, but I do feel like it's important to say that the net effect of it has been a positive one. You know, it's it's the the net, all the negatives, all the downsides of this, and there are plenty. I can I sort of at this point in my life consider that low hanging fruit. It's like really easy to focus on what is difficult and what's what's painful and what you can't do. Uh, you know, much like everything in life, it's it's very easy to point out the the negatives. It's much more difficult to spend your time appreciating and you know and developing a further appreciation for the things that you can do um and the you know one thing that the accident that 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 accident did for me was it put it put me in a mindset where i do spend a lot quite a bit of time identifying the things that i appreciate in my life and and um you know so i so i think in that in that regard like it has helped. It certainly has helped me uh, as an artist and as a creator, uh, because I'm sure of the value of crea- that the creation has for me, and that I'm sh- I, I I am positive that my that I value my passions. I'm positive that I'm happy to be alive. I'm positive of all these things that we're just like I said before, more like more similar to like a like a hypothesis you know now it's it just seems like i've got these things as facts so moving forward i can you know i can begin to deal in more subtle nuanced you know aspects of my creative life so john where do you like to hang out in philadelphia in the surrounding area i you know when when i go out at night i mean like i said when i'm off tour i am i do not go out very frequently when i do go out i I really i think one of the one of the greatest music clubs in the world it, we have here in Philadelphia. I think uh, Union Transfer is one. Yep. yep. It's just about, it's, it is quite simply one of the greatest venues. Right. On Spring Gardens. Yeah, yep. And so I spend a lot of time there. Uh, I, spend, I have spent more time there than any other place in Philadelphia uh, these past seven or eight years. Um, I think that's a fantastic place. I, I really love... Uh, the park system around here, you know, Fairmount. Like a, I'm a, I'm an avid runner, um, and, and uh, you know, I've got a dog, so I like taking walks, and, uh, hikes in the woods, and everything. I think, I think it's, I think that's a, a great feature of this city. Um, and I, you know, I'm an artist. We have one of, what, what I consider one of the greatest art museums in the world here in Philadelphia. Um, and I have just, you know, I've just been on tour for three months. I've been to as many art museums as I possibly could have been to. I still, I still feel similarly about the Philly Art Museum. I think it's, I think it's one of the greats in the world. Uh, so I think, I, you know, I think this, I, I, I love living in the city. I love, I love the, the amenities that we have here, uh, as opposed to a city like New York. Uh, and I love, I, 
I know a lot of people, you know, it's kind of easy to talk trash. Yeah, everybody here is kind of like less than kind all the time. But I, you know what? I think you can. I think that I think that we sort of wear that as a as a strange, you know, badge of honor here. It's the Rocky thing. I mean, going all yeah. the way back to that. Yeah, I mean, I underdog. I have. A, I've always liked the attitude that everybody has here. I mean, people. People do think people in Philadelphia do things, you know. People who, who at least, m- you know, my friends like. You can't you can't cruise in Philadelphia in the same way you can cruise in other cities. Uh, you you really have to, you know. I feel like we have to fight a little bit harder to get, you know, in the in the in the, you know, in the in the arts in the in the music scene, in order for us to get heard on the on a national level. Like we have to work a little bit harder than. I totally you know, agree. Couple hours up the road. Uh, where it, so we earn it. Yeah, we earn it. We're the only ones earning. No. I mean, it's, it's. I think I honestly I really do think it's a great city. I mean, the the, the music the music culture here is uh, has grown has been growing since I moved here, and I and I I think it's got one of the better music scenes in America at the at the moment uh, in terms of clubs and the number of nationally touring acts that are coming through. Uh, but also, you know, artistically, there's a, there's a, there's a great art scene here, especially especially like the underground art scene here, that's happening. There's a number of people who are very active, and I think I I truly love living here. You know, like it's 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 weird to say that. I know that a lot of people don't move out. You know, don't come from somewhere and move to Philadelphia. It seems like a lot of people, most of my friends here in Philly, have grown up here in Philly. You know, have spent most of their lives in Philly. Uh, so I feel a bit like a tourist at times, and I don't feel like there's many of me walking around. But um, you know, my wife and daughter and I moved here, and we this this is our home. Like this very much feels like our home now. Um, yeah, I think it's it's an it, it really is an awesome city. What is the best band right now? Not named Baroness. Uh, they could be from Philadelphia. They can be from somewhere else. Who's tops in your book? Tops in my book as a band. Oh boy! Current band. Current bands. You can maybe give three Man, if you that's want. That's hard. Well, I think if you you know I think in on the East Coast and I was wearing their sweatshirt a little bit earlier. Uh, up from the Boston area is a band called Converge. I think they are going to be one of. I mean they're they're in the history books already. They've 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 been one of the most influential and and important bands in, in underground music, uh, in the past 20 years. Uh, and I, and the reason is because they are absolutely phenomenal. I mean, they're, we, I remember we toured with them in maybe 2008. Uh, we were on tour with Converge and they were just one of those bands that we didn't even, we could, we were never going to top them. Not one night of that tour. Did we ever think we had a chance or an opportunity to play better than them? Cause they're, they're one of the best performing acts on the planet, um, and my love for them is not uh, a secret. I'll put it that way. Sure, sure. Uh, as far as Philly goes, though, uh, you know, I, I absolutely adore their, uh, this band called Nothing. Oh yeah, they're uh, like a uh, like Swerve Driver. I think it, it yeah, would be yeah, like little, a, they kind of have like shoegazy kind of stuff. Shoegazy thing. They kind of they they draw a lot of their sound from uh, you know from a lot of '90s acts like. My Bloody Valentine, Swerve Driver, yeah, yeah. Ride, you know, all, all, all those type of bands. But they also, they are also guys who come from a, the, you know, the DIY, like, punk and hardcore community. So there's, like, a little, there's a lot of grit to it. <laughs> Shout out to nothing out there, man. Hope you're listening, right? Yeah, they're, those guys are those guys are fantastic. And then another, another Philly band that I, I, I think is doing amazing things right now is uh, a band from West, I think they're from West Philly, called Sheer Mag. I've never heard of them. It's amazing. It's like... Uh, a punk rock version of Thin Lizzy playing Jackson Five or something. It was incredible. Wow. He's got the album right here. Yeah, there you go. They're early seven inches. Incredible, incredible band. Uh, we we very much hope to tour Sheer with Mag. Sheer Mag. We hope to tour with them before too long. One of mine uh, is Woe, and I know that they don't live here anymore, but I really like their stuff. So, funny story about Woe, and this, is, this just speaks to the, you know, the music scene at large, but a bass player from Woe uh, 
or I, th I think he was the only bass player from, from that band. Uh, it was a guy called Ben Brand, who I went to school, I went to art school with in uh, the late 90s. And I didn't see him till I moved back to Philadelphia and found out that he was in that band. Um, because the, you know, the music world's like this big. You stay in it long enough, you kind of meet everybody. Uh, which is which is awesome. You meet everybody from like, you know, all the favorite your favorite little small bands to these like giant superstars of rock music. If you just stick around long enough, you meet them all. Listen, I really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, you have a great like mindset, philosophy, and you make great music, and it, you know, really touches a lot of people out there. And you know, I see Baroness. It's like a, the complete package. You 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 pay attention to every single little detail along the way and hopefully a lot of people will appreciate that yeah i mean i i, I realize <laughs> one thing i've realized more the more and more as we go along is that you do sort of have to be careful what you wish for if you if your goal is to stand outside of genre and outside of classification you may end up there at some point and then nobody knows what to do <laughs> and nobody knows what to do with you. But, you know, the, the, look, we love, we love what we do. And, uh, you know, I make, I make visual art and I make music and I don't make a distinction between the two. You know, Baroness has been my outlet for, to pour all of, all of my heavy duty creative thoughts and ideas into for the better part of the past 15 or 20 years. Uh, I, we're, we put out five albums, several EPs, a bunch of B-sides and seven inches and stuff like that. And I don't feel like we've even begun to scratch the surface of what we're capable of. I see this. I, I don't see the band slowing down anytime soon. I don't see my art career slowing down anytime soon. I, I truly love what I do. Um, and I, for the most part, I feel like I've done it the right way. And that's important to me. It doesn't have to be important to everybody else. but. It is, it is important to me the way that, you know, the, the manner in which we carry ourselves uh, and the message that we have and the, you know, the... Yeah, I just love what I do. <laughs> Bottom line, John Baisley from The Mighty Baroness. Thanks for joining me on the True Philadelphia Podcast. Thank you. It was a pleasure. We thank John Baisley for being so candid and generous with his time and for allowing us to share an excerpt of Front Toward Enemy and Cold-Blooded Angels, which you are listening to right now. Both tracks are on Golden Gray. John is resting up for yet another overseas tour in the spring of 2020. It will bring Baroness to Australia, New Zealand, and back to Europe again. As John said, he'll be ready because this musician travels well. I'm Matt O'Donnell, and this is the True Philadelphia Podcast. Oh, no, no, no.